The story of a kid who is deprived freedom, independence, in favor of the sheltering of their parents is a tale as old as time. It is one of the oldest cliches in the book, but like with many cliches, there is a lot of truth to them. Just because it's common doesn't mean it doesn't resonate with us as humans. Caitlin from Arcane is often described in regards to her relationship with Vi. And while this bond is incredibly important, that is not all there is to Caitlin. Arcane did not skimp out with their side character stories and put a lot of effort in to making every character deep, meaningful, and relatable. Caitlyn's story is not just one of a kid that was never allowed the space for her to develop her own identity, but also of somebody who realizes that if she is to uphold her own moral standards, the world that she grew up in, the world that she knows, can no longer exist. My name is Liddy, and welcome to Shaped by Stories, where we discuss how and why our favorite stories shape our own. Let's get into it. Caitlin is the only child of Tobias and Cassandra Kiriman, Cassandra Kiriman being a member of Piltover's ruling council. Caitlin was raised as an upper-class young girl, and she's very bright and intelligent, but she was also raised with the expectation that she would someday take her mother's place on the council. Caitlin, being an only child, has a lot of pressure as the only offspring of the Kiriman family that we are aware of. As a result, Caitlin was heavily sheltered by her parents so she could someday be the person they need to lead their family into the next generation. Caitlin wasn't aware of the harsher realities of Piltover outside of the city proper. And while I think this is partially due to her parents not wanting Caitlyn in any danger whatsoever, ignorance is bliss as they say, I do think her mother was interested in ensuring her daughter, when she inherited her seat on the council, would follow the status quo that she herself did. As a result of her sheltered upbringing, Caitlyn is a rather naive character at the start of her story. She had it easy growing up. She was never really impacted by the risks of the real world, and was never allowed to really grow as a result. She was a bird in a gilded cage, strong-willed, but unable to really do anything for herself. As many of us can probably relate, especially if you are an only child with overprotective parents, this is so frustrating. <laughs> Your parents mean well and they love you, but you're stuck in a box that you can't really self-actualize inside. But even still, Caitlin had some liberties. Caitlin became a crack shot and would take part in shooting competitions. We see Caitlin win a shooting competition against Grayson, the sheriff of the Enforcers. But Caitlin knows the only reason she won is because Grayson let her. Caitlin at first thinks her parents paid Grayson off so their daughter could win. And you can sort of see that this might be a regular thing for Caitlin. She's frustrated at the idea, but she doesn't sound very surprised. Caitlin likely never gets to feel like anything is earned. Things are given to her, and she's smart enough to know this and to feel dissatisfied. Caitlin just wants to own something. She wants something to just be hers for once. But Grayson admits that it wasn't a matter of being paid off. She thought Caitlin deserved to win. Grayson explains that, for her, shooting a gun is not something you do just to win a trophy. Shooting a gun is a means to an end, that end being protecting Piltover. Grayson says that protecting her people is enough of a trophy. To Grayson, protecting the people of Piltover is more than enough of a trophy. If Grayson shoots, it's for the greater good. It's not about pageantry, something Caitlyn's social circle is likely heavily focused on. The whole shooting contest is a very showy thing. And I think by Grayson, not shooting here was for the greater good. Because now she gets to explain to Caitlyn the concept of knowing what you're shooting for. 
What is your purpose? What drives you? When Grayson asks Caitlin what she is shooting for, this is the question that spurs her forward in her search for her own path. Caitlin has likely never been asked about what she wants or what she feels. She spent her whole life walking a path laid out for her. She's told what to do, how to feel, what to think even. But here is Grayson, a strong, capable woman who does hold a fair bit of her own power, at least trying to do what she believes is right. For all we know, Grayson very well could have also been highborn, we don't know. But you can tell that Grayson sees in this girl someone with a lot of potential. I think she admires the fact that Caitlyn is just willing to be like, did my parents pay you? Like, she's not gonna fake pleasantries, she's just gonna come out and ask. She's got spunk and she's got strength. And while we don't see Caitlyn answer Grayson's question, we do see her first stage of trying to answer that question by going against her family's wishes and joining the Enforcers. Grayson's been dead for a number of years, but Caitlyn still pushed to join the Enforcers anyway. And Caitlyn genuinely means business with her work. Caitlyn joined to do just what Grayson always strove to do, to do good and to protect the people of Piltover. In her mind, Enforcers are a noble group, fighting a noble cause. Again, Caitlyn is naive and she only sees things through the lens of a very sheltered, highborn girl from Piltover. She doesn't see the cracks in the surface of this facade that she's been raised to see. Caitlyn was also raised under the impression that she would someday take the seat of the Kiramans on the council. A seat involved with, insofar as she knows, making the best choices for the city. But Caitlyn actually wants to do something now. She doesn't want to sit around attending banquets, shaking hands, and being a wallflower. So you can imagine her annoyance with how her mom meddles with her postings, always making sure that her daughter is never in any actual danger, but also never really able to make the actual difference that she wants to. Even as an adult, Caitlyn is denied agency. She is denied the ability to choose her own challenges and fight them. I love this trope, archetype, cliche of the person who is just so overprotected, but they're fighting to do something. They're fighting to break out of that cage. I think that's something many of us can relate to. Despite Caitlyn's awareness of her mother's meddling, she still takes her job very seriously, even if all she's doing is guarding playground equipment or just standing around at night while her co-workers smoke on the steps of some banquet building. When Caitlyn sees danger, she doesn't run. She puts herself on the line in place of others. She's always the first on the scene, like with the fire that Jinx starts. She's the one who takes pictures of Jinx's graffiti on the ship, noting all the crystals, finding that guy that Vi keeps beating up. And she's also not cruel to him either. Many enforcers are pretty cruel and uncaring, especially to those of the Undercity. And while Caitlyn has almost certainly been raised around this prejudice, she has also been, I think, sheltered from that prejudice. I always think of the shot where she's inside the gate with the umbrella just sitting there in the rain, water symbolism, while Jace is trying to like get in, but it's like, I feel bad for Caitlyn because she, I think, wants out, even from a young age. That's why she liked to hang out with Jace, and she's just sitting there like, I'm stuck in this cage and it's really pretty. And her mom just being like, leave her alone, Jace, just says to me, yes, her parents want to protect her, but they are keeping her trapped. Caitlyn's curiosity grates on Marcus, the new sheriff, as she's walking far too close to the line of his own shady dealings. But Caitlyn's kindness, when she talks to Silco's goon, despite him being from the Undercity, shows how capable she is of opening certain doors. I think Caitlyn's earnestness and kindness just makes a lot of people feel like they can trust her. She opens people up. Caitlyn doesn't really have a deceptive bone in her body, for the most part. And while this might be a symptom of her naivete, it helps her to really crack into frosty situations that most other people would find very difficult. She's able to see into people in a way that other enforcers just can't. Her compassion opens a lot of pathways for her. 
I do think that this is a little hint of how effective a diplomat she could be or a politician, but for now, she is an excellent detective and investigator. Even after Caitlyn is injured by Jinx's fire, she's still spending her time trying to figure out who Jinx is, who Silco is. She's very analytical, a born detective, and she's determined to solve this mystery herself, even though Marcus has told her to let it go. Caitlyn is still so dedicated to that simple question Grayson asked her all those years ago, to following her own answer to that question. I like that they don't make Caitlyn actually answer it, it's up to us to interpret what that answer is. Even I'm kind of up in the air about maybe exactly what it is. I do think a lot of Caitlyn's motivations come from her, number one, trying to forge her own path and do her own thing, but Caitlyn is also a very noble person. She wants to do the right thing. She wants to help people. She has a very optimistic view of the world. Is this naive? Maybe, but then a pessimist is what an optimist calls a realist. An idiot is what a pessimist calls an optimist. It's up to you. But Caitlin has a good heart and she wants to help people and she wants to see things through to the end. Even after getting suspended from the force, Caitlin refuses to drop this case. She knows something's up. Her detective senses are tingling. So, using Jace's newfound status as a counselor and her own sort of charm, she manages to get into Stillwater Prison. And there she meets her frostiest situation yet. The violet frosting for her cupcake, if you will. Caitlin and Vi are a remarkable pair. I don't often ship couples in stories, but God, I ship them. <laughs> I love every scene they're in. But Caitlin is so much more than Vi's girlfriend slash handler. Caitlin crossing that red line when she approaches Vi's cell shows right from the beginning that she is not just another line-toting pilty. She's willing to break the mold. If she's gonna do things, Caitlin will do them her way. Caitlin, a girl from the upper city, raised in the lap of luxury and privilege, surrounded by prejudice for those who live in Zaun, takes a chance on the gutter rat Vi. The prisoner Vi. Not only does she secure Vi's release so Vi can help her in the Undercity, Caitlin also actually asks about how many beatings Vi's gotten. Well, you could argue this might just be Caitlyn checking to see how difficult Vi might be for her to handle. I do think it's more about Caitlyn's good nature and her ability to see into people. I think she knows that Vi is not just another imprisoned jerk, that there's this sadness to her. There's a mystery to Vi, and Caitlyn being analytical and somebody who wants to solve mysteries, I think wants to solve Vi in a way. You can see Vi twitch when her cell opens, like she's expecting another beating, only for her to be surprised that it's Caitlyn, there to bring her out into the sun for the first time in years. Caitlyn is actually allowed, with Vi, to take on challenges that she was prevented from facing all her life. She takes the risky way down into Zaun, trying to keep on Vi's trail. She navigates the city herself to find Vi after she runs off to fight Savika alone. And she also puts herself out there trying to riz up that lady in the brothel, even after Vi just made her knees weak. <laughs> you know Caitlyn's nervous and probably very scared. She's in this new world and she's a fish out of water, but she still does what she knows she has to do. She's even sort of doing what she wants to do. Good for her. But if Caitlyn is gay and there's this expectation of her carrying on the Kiriman line, that's a lot of unwanted pressure. Let Caitlyn just be who she wants to be. Let her riz up all the girls with her awkward riz. Let her have fun, come on. I think that whole concept of legacy is probably another added little, oh God, why? Why am I not allowed to do what I want? Can I not even be with who I want? I'm, you go, Caitlyn, you go. <laughs> and Caitlyn never treats Vi as lesser either. She might get frustrated with her, but she doesn't look down on her. She doesn't just leave Vi to handle things herself, she's right there with her. As I mentioned earlier, Caitlyn's sheltering almost makes her prejudice against Zonites very minor. Caitlyn's goodness helps her see past her own limited, shallow perceptions, 
and she's able to accept the evidence she's presented as she navigates the Undercity. She sees what's going on down here. She feels the tension. She sees the poverty. She sees the injustice. Caitlin is able to accept the facts, regardless of her personal feelings, and that is the most important trait of a proper investigator. When Caitlin shoots Savika, she doesn't shoot to kill. She probably was hoping to question her, but even if that had been possible, Caitlin's first concern is Vi. Vi, who ran off without a word. Vi, who's been taking her on a field trip all day, kind of dragging her around. Caitlin is not mad at her at all, and Vi is very moved by Caitlin saving her life. I think Vi was really putting Caitlin through her paces, half trying to shake her off, but also half trying to see what she could do. And I think Vi is genuinely impressed that Caitlin is able to handle herself. Vi, at this point, trusts Caitlin to take her to her childhood home, that crappy shack in the pits filled with those destroyed by Shimmer. And Caitlin is genuinely horrified by what she's seeing. This pit full of these monstrous husks, and she hustles to get Vi inside. When she leaves to get medicine, she is at first ready to shoot Huck. Though, once again, her ability to see people is what makes her lower her gun. She hears Huck out, and he helps her get Shimmers to heal Vi. She asks him why would he destroy himself with Shimmer like he did, and she actually listens to him without judgment. She hugs him. She gives warmth to someone who desperately needs it, and it's so sad that Huck does sell them out in the end, but it's still heartwarming that Caitlyn is so pure that she's willing to hug this guy who's so disfigured and monster-like now. She sets aside her own obvious fear and probably a degree of disgust in order to recognize this is a person who needs help. But also, with Caitlyn giving up her gun in order to get the Shimmer for Vi, I sort of see that as Caitlyn choosing to step off the path of violence. Yes, Caitlyn doesn't shoot to kill. She's a lot like Grayson in that way. It's not about taking life, it's about saving life. And in a way, by Caitlyn giving up that gun, that is her adhering to that goal. She gives up her weapon to save a life, not like the enforcers on the bridge who have their weapons to take lives. We see this even in the opening cinematic Caitlin stands in direct contrast to the enforcer who shot a man while he was down and likely unarmed. It's not about violence or power for Caitlin. Her choices and her work as an enforcer is all about doing the right thing, and it's beautiful. Caitlin heals Vi, and she's there to comfort her. She's proving her loyalty, her genuine goodness, and you can see how much that means to Vi. There's actually a very striking resemblance between Caitlyn and Vi's mother, and make of this what you will, but to me, this just sort of shows that Vi hasn't really had anybody to care for her in that way since she was a little girl. I think Vi gets a deep degree of comfort and safety from Caitlyn. Caitlyn helps Vi escape Silco, and the two flee above ground. They both end up kidnapped by the Firelights after Vi's brief reunion with her sister, and this is the first time Caitlyn and Vi kinda have a fight. To Caitlyn, Vi was misleading about Jinx being her sister. To Vi, Caitlyn was misleading about her whole purpose here. But this is almost a little couple's spat, with how Caitlyn genuinely freaks out when Vi is taken away. Not because Caitlyn is left alone, but because she feels very protective of Vi. I think it's easy to look at Vi and think she's the protective one of the two, but for me, Caitlyn is the one who does most of the protecting. Caitlyn protects Vi from Savika. Caitlyn protects Vi from getting into trouble topside. She protects Vi from herself. She protects Vi from more harm in prison. Vi has been someone who has always felt this immense pressure to save and protect others. And finally, here is somebody who is there to protect and save her. After all, saving and protecting people is what I think Caitlyn became an enforcer for. Caitlyn is a sentinel. 
Echo and Caitlin don't exactly get off on the right foot, but through Vi, both can see their shared earnestness. We sort of see, with Echo and Caitlin, two idealistic potential leaders on either side of the river. They both work to make things better for their own people. They both want to protect and serve, essentially. Echo can't help but listen to Caitlyn's genuine plea to let her take the Hextech back, and Caitlyn can't help but acknowledge that much of what Echo says about all his people have suffered is real. Including the rude awakening that much of that grief is caused by the Enforcers. Caitlyn, again, joined the Enforcers because she wanted to do good. She wanted to help people and keep them safe. At first, she denies that the Enforcers are working for Silco, that they're just as bad as any other gang in the streets of Zaun. After all, if this is true, then Caitlyn's whole life, as well as her independent decision to join the Enforcers, would be kind of rendered a falsehood of sorts. And that's not her fault. Caitlyn's been faced by this truth with remarks from other Zaunites, like Vi. But I think her seeing this truth mirrored back at her through another, albeit more battered, idealist is what hammers this truth home. She's forced to see the damage of this world that she's lived on top of unknowingly, but she's also forced to sort of see that her mother has been complacent in it. I still think Caitlyn has a gift of seeing people for who they are, aided by her own unassuming nature. And again, this cracks even Echo's harsh shell, opening him up to a begrudging compromise with her. Caitlin's words about breaking the cycle of violence aren't just empty words, either. We see her willingness to do this by that trade of her gun. She has already begun this path. And you can see how much her empathetic appeal to Echo really warms Vi's heart. Caitlin actually cares. And of course, the idea of leaving Vi on that bridge breaks her a bit because they're in love. I think Caitlyn feels an attachment to protecting Vi because Vi genuinely does need protection. That is, I think, Caitlyn's ultimate goal is to protect the people who need it. And there, go there goes Vi. Bye, Vi. Well, not, not bye, Vi. Well, <laughs> After Vi saves Caitlyn and returns her to her home, they share a really tender moment. And even down to the body language, you can see how safe Vi feels with Caitlyn. You can't help but recall Vi flinching in her cell, her body language, and the dark jokes about the abuse she endured in prison. Vi lying in a fetal position while Caitlin hears her out shows just how much trust there is between the two. Vi believes in what Caitlin says, and Caitlin really pushes her mother to listen to her, to listen to Vi, and to give her a chance to speak to the council. And you know, for all of Caitlin's parents' moments of maybe not the best judgment when it comes to raising their daughter, they do care about her a lot. Someone in my comment section, I will try to find the comment and post it here, they basically pointed out that Powder and Caitlyn are very similar. Both were sheltered by the people who cared about them. They're both very bright, able to piece together complex puzzles and conundrums. And as they grow older, they have these pressures of their more prestigious parents sort of placed upon them, albeit in different ways. But the major difference is that Caitlyn had a far more healthier upbringing. Caitlin had the privilege of growing up with wealth and safety, supported by two parents who loved her very much. Jinx's dislike of Caitlin is so intense, but I can't help but wonder if they would have been very similar had Jinx been adopted by, say, someone in Piltover versus Silco. Vi leaves Caitlin after this failed council meeting, and Caitlin is heartbroken. Vi feels stupid for ever believing in the beautiful dream Caitlin spoke of, of believing that the world could truly be better for people like her. But even despite this, Caitlin still asks Vi, what about us? Vi refers to them as oil and water, saying that they were never meant to mix. 
Vi is oil from the grungy, hard reality of the realm below. The place everyone just wants to forget about. But Caitlin is pure. Literally, her name actually means pure in Greek? Ancient Greek, I think? I'll, I'll post that on the, on the screen so you can read it. Caitlin is water, and the fact that lots of Caitlin's scenes have water in them line up with this. Caitlyn is fresh and pure and untainted, which I think hints at how things might go in season two. I think she's going to have a, a very rough beginning of season two, we shall see. But I also want to say, as somebody who bakes a lot, I have a problem. I bake too much. I need to stop. I bake too many sweets. You need to mix oil and water to make even just a normal cake mix. In order to make a cupcake, you need water and oil. Make of that what you will. Caitlyn's shower scene then shows Vi leaving in reverse, as in Vi is coming back. And I do think that this scene is Caitlyn wishing she could just turn back time. Now I'm thinking of the share song, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and stop Vi from leaving. She's worried about her and she misses her. And I do think Caitlyn would have gone out to find her had Jinx not just, you know, kidnapped her for the tea party. At the tea party, Caitlyn is the bargaining chip. I think in Jinx's eyes, Caitlyn is the monster that Vi needs to protect her from. Caitlyn to Jinx represents her being replaced. Caitlyn represents enforcers, a demon in a lot of Jinx's nightmares, I think. Jinx tells Vi that basically she has to choose, either kill Caitlyn or lose powder. Vi obviously doesn't want to hurt Caitlyn, so she tries to barter with Jinx, tries to say that they can leave the city together if they just leave Caitlyn alive. But Caitlyn manages to escape her bonds and aims fish bones at Jinx. Caitlyn is ready to shoot. She knows Jinx is the danger. Caitlyn is willing to shoot to protect the city, but she hesitates on Vi's behalf. Listening to someone she respects and cares about only for things to go really badly because of that hesitation. Not entirely unlike Grayson's final moments, where in trying to do what they think is right, things go really bad in a way nobody expected, and then it just gets worse. Caitlyn gets knocked out by Jinx in this moment of hesitation, only to reawaken when it's too late. Her final moments in season one are her now leaning on Vi, while she watches Jinx's rocket, a weapon she came so close to preventing in the first place, hurling towards the council chambers, spelling out her mother's likely doom. But we won't know where Caitlyn's arc takes her until season two, and I refuse to look at the leaks. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. I love Caitlyn. I know I was going to do Mel's video next, but then I just got thinking of Caitlyn. Caitlyn is, I think, one of the most relatable characters, especially if you're an only child who was relatively sheltered by your parents who loved you very much. I really enjoyed watching Caitlyn grow and also how accepting she is of conflicting information, essentially. I love a character that is willing to change, that wants to grow, and Caitlyn does. That, I think, is one of her most brilliant traits, is that she just, she wants to grow. She wants to be a better person. I love that. I think a lot of the time, growth in characters is portrayed as just people going through suffering and then they just automatically grow without realizing it. And I think that that is true. I think our brains do work like that. But it's just really inspiring to see a character who actively is like, I want to change, I want to be better, I want to help people, and I am willing to accept that maybe not all my views are what I thought was right. I just love that, and I'm very interested to see where they take her in season two. I think it's going to be a much darker direction for a bit, but uh, we shall see. Thank you very much to my members. I really appreciate you guys. Thank you. You're going up and down the screen. I Chef Rowlett. The whole time I was making this, I'm thinking of Chef Rowlett there and the members because of cupcakes. And now I want to go make a cupcake on behalf of Chef Rowlett, but I'm sure they won't be as good as Chef Rowlett's cupcakes. Maybe I'll make cupcakes and I'll take a picture of them. Why am I doing ASMR like... <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. <laughs> I will see you again in the next one. Until then.
Goodbye. <laughs>